My name is Christy. I am a junior here at Ecker College Search and Rescue, and this is our Operations and Communications Center console. Um, with all of our computer screens here, they're all independently used for different purposes. This is our case recorder folder for the most part. We have our case systems and boat logs uh, handy on the desktop for any uh, situation that comes in. We can immediately get to documenting it. This is our 911 login screen. So this is if anyone calls 911 and there is a marine rescue, uh, they will dispatch us. Our name will pop up on that and it will also go over fire dispatch radio, which is located over here and is our 800 megahertz radio. Currently it is set to fire dispatch, so if any calls come over, uh, we will hear them. We can listen to any call that comes over uh, through dispatch. We monitor channel 16 and 68. 16 is the international hailing uh, and distress frequency, and then we monitor our working channel, channel 68 as well. Uh, this is our navigation computer. Uh, we have OpenCPN currently held on it. Uh, as you can see, we have a search pattern going here, and then our entire area of response goes <laughs> all the way up to Johns Pass up here, and then down to Longboat Pass all the way down here. And we do include the entirety of Tampa Bay and 10 miles out as well. All right, so as you can see here, we do have our two of our run cards uh, pulled up. These are kind of documents that help us confirm and take case information when it comes in. So if there is a flare sighting, we don't have to think about what the exact questions that we would ask, what Coast Guard needs to know, what dispatch needs to know. We can just be like, we can just look at this and see, okay, we have a flare, we need to ask them what time they saw the flare, where was it reported, who they are, um, and what color the flares, so we can get our full picture of information from the very start without having to talk back and forth between Coast Guard or ourselves or 911 dispatch. We would not receive any EPIRB signal directly at our center here. Uh, those go to the Coast Guard and to 911 dispatch. So they would then contact us and from there, we would be dispatched to their location. Also, oftentimes with an EPIRB being set off, the Coast Guard will pass out a MARB over Channel 16. It is a marine request for assistance. So any mariner in the area is alerted to the possibility of seeing someone in distress. They're asked to assist if possible and report all sightings to the United States Coast Guard uh, via Channel 16. So we do respond to those as well. A lot of times there will be a pon pon, a notice of distress for the general public and we will hear it and then Coast Guard will either contact us directly or we will call them directly at their sector and communication center to see if they need our assistance, if there's something they need from us at all, and then if we can respond. Most times, mariners do not describe themselves in the three stages of possible distress, which are security, well the three different um, notices that the Coast Guard releases are securities, pom-poms, and maydays. And usually they do not describe themselves as that. Mayday is oftentimes reported as a mayday by the boater, um, but that's usually a call for help, even saying the words help, we count as a mayday. A pon pon is usually described to the Coast Guard as someone hailing them on channel 16, and the Coast Guard responds with something along the lines of, like, vessel hailing the Coast Guard, this is Coast Guard, Sector St. Petersburg, on channel 68, please state your position and nature of distress and then they go through their own version of our sit sheet. Um, so this is based actually off of what they use, and it's just a little sheet that has pretty much all of our immediate information we need. Time, color ID, our case number for our record systems that can be filled in later, um, position, so where they are, if they're anchored, so if they're moving, what's wrong with them, how can we like see them, what do they look like, um, where are they out of, and how can we contact them is our main information that we gather with this piece of information, with this card. And the Coast Guard has a very similar one. Theirs is quite a bit longer, though. <laughs> and so they'll usually take case, case information via the radio, and then they will ask the person if, let's say they're disabled. They, they sometimes ask, do you have any friends or family? They can bring you fuel. Um, have you contacted any commercial agencies, and they try to go through like normal channels first. But in our AOR, they will also issue a pom-pom, and if it's in our area of response, they may even call us directly via landline and say, hi, like this is the Coast Guard, we have this disabled vessel, it's pretty close to you. 336 foot sailing vessel, name three sheets to the wind with 
John Martin on board to a 36-foot sailing vessel named Three Sheets to the Wind with John Martin on board. This is the United States Coast Guard, Dr. St. Petersburg, on Channel 16. Over. So that's probably a call that's been set up on a communication schedule. They've been in contact before. They've already given them their information. They know of possible distress that they're in. Um, and they've set up a communication schedule until their process has been resolved, until whatever is happening has been resolved. Um, a lot of times the Coast Guard cannot launch immediately because there's no immediate danger to the person on board. Uh, they have different stages. There are alert stages and I don't know what the other one's called, but it's basically their process for launching a boat. And because we are, we don't have a direct legal oversight or duty to respond, um, we don't always have to go. And because of that, we can choose when we go. And there's a lot less red tape for us, so we're a lot, we can launch a lot quicker. We can launch with just a position if we think it's warranted. Uh, whereas the Coast Guard can't launch without knowing exactly what they're going to, exactly what they need, what unit they need, if they need a helicopter or a small boat or a medium boat. So. EPIRBs are a great way to maintain your safety on a vessel, and it's because not only do some give you a nature of distress, they give you an exact location and their batteries last forever. So. Unlike with a lot of marine VHF radios where you press the distress button, there's no, sometimes if you don't have it connected to a GPS, you can no longer get their information of their location. Even They just know someone's in distress somewhere. We don't know why, we don't know where, we don't know how. So with an EPIRB, you can get a location, you can get a nature of distress, depending on the model, and they're very fast. So about seven minutes after an EPIRB has been um, activated, the dispatch centers of the United States Coast Guard and Pinellas County 911 dispatch will have those positions and they'll be already dispatching people to their locations. We usually launch about five minutes to ten minutes after a call. Um, and so we will be underway and over the summer we had one where it was an EPIRB that was activated because someone was going to cardiac arrest offshore. And offshore is a really hard place to get to when you have a patient there because there's no landmarks. You can say, I'm 10 miles off this landmark, but there's a lot of degree variation. Your heading could be slightly off. You could miss them. With an EPIRB, you have an exact GPS location where you can go to and you can go directly to them. And it's, it's a great help when you're trying to respond quickly and effectively to someone on the water that is in dire need of your response.